Welcome back to ECE 441A, 541A. Maybe everyone's skipping the commercials. They'll fast forward through that and show up a little bit later. But homework number six is due on Friday. And that will be the last time that we meet physically until the exam the following Friday. There is some additional information relative to root locus sketching on D2L. But just as a heads up, there won't be a class on campus Monday, and there won't be a class physically on Wednesday. But I will probably provide you with some material for you to watch or study in lieu of those two absences. And that will be helpful, I hope, for homework number seven, which is due on Wednesday, the day the class period before our next exam. Our next exam, exam number three, is a week from Friday. In anticipation of maybe some questions, I am opening up special office hours since Monday. Campus will be closed on Veterans Day. Wednesday, I will not be around, so Tuesday from 8.30 to 10.30, you can try to find me in 523 for office hours. Lab number three, it's not due until the last class period of the semester, which may sound a long way off, but that material is going to be, you're going to be held accountable for that material, the concepts of lab number three on exam number three. And lab number three is really designing controllers output-based controllers. We've already designed one controller in lab number two where we were assuming we were measuring both position and velocity. Now we will just assume we're measuring position in lab number three and how do we use that limited feedback data to maybe still achieve acceptable performance with our system. And we'll design a phase lead controller and we will design a PID controller in lab number three. 541A students, you'll have deliverable number one due the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. That's to tell me what you're planning to do, and there is a drop box for that. And deliverable two and three is due the last day of class. For homework number, or for problem 714, you can consult one of the figures in table 9.3 which shows you a conditionally stable system. Conditionally stable means that for different values of k your system may be unstable, then stable, then stable again. So as you're turning that k knob you may go through different intervals or ranges of k where at one point k is stable, then it's unstable, then it's stable again, etc. And that's what problem 714 is asking you to do. And you can now say, well, where is it crossing the imaginary axis? That's now a point on the root locus which says that the phase has to be minus 180 degrees. Is there another tool that you know that you've used to find phase angle information? Well, I'm sort of leading myself, but that's the Bode plot. If you sketched the Bode plot for that system, you might see the phase passing up and down through minus 180 degrees, and the frequency where that occurs is now actually the frequency where you're going to cross over on your root locus diagram for stability or not stability. Where do you cross relative to the system in problem 714. So there are different ways. I don't think you want to look at the Ruth array for that system because it's quite involved. So sketching the Bode plot, and you can sketch the Bode plot in MATLAB, that's fine, and that will then give you some clues as to what frequencies you're looking for relative to imaginary axis crossing. Today what I want to do is return to the controller design approach that or system that we were playing with before which was phase lead 
The last controller we designed with phase lead was pretty straightforward because we actually used a zero to cancel one of our poles and then we located the pole to give us the appropriate settling time. If we don't have quite that easy of a task, what I want to do now is say, where do we actually put that pole? Well, we can use that pole as a design variable and slide it around to change the phase angle associated with the entire system, G sub C and G, and we'll slide that pole or locate that pole based on satisfying the phase angle condition, which if a point is on the root locus, the phase has to be minus 180 degrees. Now, that being said, let me provide you, here's now the alert if you're if you have set up your cell phone or your smartphone to receive alerts, here's one of those alerts. And it, your phone might be going off. But it's mainly a information item. The plant and controller that we will be playing with now, when we're sprinkling more poles and more zeros onto the complex S-plane, we're probably not going to just be looking at two pole systems anymore. And most of our design guidelines or design specs have been assuming that we had a pure two pole system. Now if we have more poles and more zeros, we no longer have that scenario. So view these guidelines with a grain of salt. If you now design a controller and you simulate it in MATLAB and you go, but I put my poles so that I would have a percent overshoot of 5%. Why do I have 30% overshoot? Well, it may be the interaction of, different, of additional poles and additional zeros. So use these guidelines or these dominant pole design spec concepts as guidelines. That's the alert. So if you simulate this and you go, well, what happened? I thought I put these poles where I would have a particular percent overshoot, and I'm not getting that. Why did that happen? Well, now we have more poles and more zeros present, and that's what the issue is. The pure two-pole system that we've been playing with gave rise to figure 5.7, and here it's clean. If you want a particular percent overshoot, you just find the zeta value that you need. That zeta value can now be translated into an angle, and you now know how to locate the two complex poles angles to give you the percent overshoot that you want. That's figure 5.7. Now, if you are dealing with something that's not a pure two-pole system, the book gives you a few figures to try to gain a little bit of insight into what happens when you have three, a three-pole system or what happens if you have a two-pole system with a real zero. And that's what we'll talk about briefly here. The first scenario in figure 11 in chapter 5 is concerned with three poles, and I've tried to highlight those in yellow to show you where the locations are, and they're assuming in this sketch that their natural frequency is one. Those complex poles now are a distance of one away from the origin, and I've tried to make it clear that that's now omega sub n. That's our natural frequency. Well, if you have a natural frequency of one, then the damping is actually sigma. I'm sorry, it's sigma, but it's also just zeta since omega sub n is 1. Sigma is zeta omega sub n, so don't think that, oh, based on this figure, sigma is zeta. No, sigma is still zeta omega sub n, but omega sub n in this particular diagram is equal to 1. First, let's put on our cap that says we're dealing with three poles. Now think about just having three poles and this is the scenario. If you have three poles and two are complex conjugate, then we can slide that third one around based on gamma. Gamma. Is that what gamma is? Can't even think of my Greek symbols. All right, so now we have 
that particular pole location that we're moving, sliding it around and seeing the influence. And here is a plot. I'm annotating it a few ways, but you can go back and refer to this. The main one that you want, or the, the second order plot is actually the dashed line. And the, the two-pole system has omega sub n equal to 1, and it has a zeta value of 0.45, since 2 zeta is 0.9. So the zeta is 0.45, and we know that with a zeta of 0.45, that gives us a percent overshoot of 20%. And look where that dashed line goes. It goes to 1.2. So it is giving us our 20%. That's the pure two-pole system behavior is the dashed line. Suppose now that we introduce a third pole. Let's look at the green plot where that pole is actually quite a ways beyond minus 1, it's now at minus 4.5. Well, that gives rise to that green plot, and that's not much different. So the pole is f a fair distance away from the dominant poles, and that didn't influence our response too much. But suppose we pull that third pole in closer to the origin and actually make it have a real part equal to minus 1. So now we have two complex poles that have an angle of 63 degrees and then a real pole that's the same distance away from the origin. And look what happens. It now, those three poles sort of start playing together, singing together, however you want to think about it. But those three poles are now, you don't really have two dominant, you now have three that are sort of playing together as a team. And what have they done? They've reduced your percent overshoot from our two-pole system thinking from 20% down to maybe about 10%. What's the settling time? Settling time's about the same. But it's a little bit slower, isn't it? It doesn't quite get up to its peak as soon as a pure two-pole system. So that's... If the pole, so what do you take away from this? <laughs> As that third pole inches in and becomes influential with your dominant poles, then it changes a fair amount your behavior relative to the pure, pure two pole case. But if you had that pole way out at minus 10, if, if your dominant poles had a distance of one away from the origin, then it wouldn't impact your two-pole system behavior that much. Here we moved it to minus four and a half and it's still not impacting that original dotted line behavior very much. But if you slide that pole in closer to the origin, then you start having some more interesting contribution from that third pole. Is that clear? So if you have three poles, now you might have to think about the influence of that third real pole relative to two dominant complex pole pairs. That's three poles. That one's not so dramatic. The drama comes in when we add a zero. So here, the one that we would typically think about is the green curve here. This is our pure two-pole system is the green curve. And the other curves are created based on a location of one real zero. And I've tried to highlight accordingly where those zeros are. Let's look at the yellow zero at minus two. So I've put a two there. It's really at minus two, but it's a factor of two beyond where the dominant pole's real part is. This curve that you're seeing or these curves are showing a ratio of a over zeta omega sub n. A is the zero location 
or its value, and zeta omega sub n is the real part of the pole. So in the yellow case, the zero is a multiple of two to the left of where your poles are. And it has a fairly significant change in percent overshoot. If you originally had a percent overshoot of 20%, now with the omega or the, with the zero at two, now we're up to about what? 75% overshoot. It's the second curve. I didn't illustrate the case where the zero is a factor of 10. But the factor of 10, you can see, is it's not much different than the blue curve or the green curve. It's almost right on top. That's when the zero is quite a ways out into the left half plane. But as you slide that zero closer in to the origin and have less of a difference in the ratio of zero to pole, then it starts impacting the percent overshoot behavior. So when the zero is a factor of two beyond, we have about a 75% overshoot. When it's right underneath the poles, look at what happens. Now we're almost 200% for our overshoot. I'm sorry, 100% for our overshoot because we're almost at two. So we would have two minus one over one, so we would have almost 100% overshoot in that case. But then what happens when we have the zero even closer to the origin than our poles are? That's the purple illustration. Then we are three times in terms of our final value. So now we have a 200% because that zero now is close to the imaginary axis relative to our poles. What this is trying to say is when we start sprinkling zeros and poles on our diagram to give us a controlled system, we might deteriorate away from the classical thinking of a pure two-pole system. This, I hope, illustrates that the green curve is not reproduced when we put a zero down. When we put a zero down, now things start to change. And as that zero gets closer and closer to the imaginary axis, it has more and more of an impact on the percent overshoot. That's the idea. So now let's look at sprinkling poles and zeros in. Why are we doing that? Well, we're trying to modify our system's closed-loop behavior. Here's the phase lead controller. It's just a first-order system. It has one pole at minus P sub C, and it has one zero at minus Z sub C, and for a phase lead, that zero is closer to the imaginary axis than the pole is. That's the structure of our phase lead controller. And what do we have the ability to select? We can put the pole down, we can put the zero down, and we can adjust the gain. We now have three parameters to adjust. Three design variables to try to influence our system's behavior. What are the characteristics of this phase lead controller? The phase lead controller, remember, is designed to dramatically change the shape of our original root locus with just a pure gain. So one of the characteristics is we actually want to be able to speed up the response by introducing this particular zero pole combination, a phase lead controller. We also might want to redu reduce the overshoot, reduce the percent overshoot. And those two together allow us to change the transient behavior.
in control theory, it's not that different from life. There's always trade-offs. You don't always get everything that you want. In this case, we have changed our transient behavior, but actually we may actually deteriorate the steady state accuracy. And you'll see this in the lab. With a phase lead controller, you might be able to speed up how quickly that mass gets to the final destination, but your steady state error may be huge. You may have said, oh, I really wanted to go to 2000, and I only made it to 800 or I only made it to 1,200. So the steady state air may be quite compromised with a phase lead controller. So the third characteristic is that we may increase the steady state air. And as I said before, these two, one and two and three, are really sort of what we have to worry about in terms of trading off or thinking about which one is the one we want to focus on or how do we change the dynamics, the transient behavior, while still maybe achieving acceptable steady state air. Next time when we get together, we will talk about how do we improve steady state accuracy. Here we're changing the transient behavior with the zero closer to the imaginary axis than the pole. If we flipped those, we would have a phase lag controller, and that one actually doesn't worry so much about changing the root locus dramatically, but it worries about steady state accuracy. And when we combine those, a phase lead and a phase lag, we can get that in the form of a PID controller. And now a PID controller allows us to think about improving transient behavior and steady state accuracy simultaneously. But the controller is a little bit more complicated. So here, let's look through a, work through a design. Here's a G of S. We have a real zero and we have three poles. Our first part of the design is to simply figure out what's going on. And if I have an S-plane already there, I probably am thinking, how do I design a controller to get my closed loop poles to go through minus two plus and minus J2? That's the design specification. So instead of saying something like a settling time, percent overshoot, and having you translate those into pole locations, now I'm saying, okay, if I'm grading this exam, I don't want 100 different answers. Maybe I want one unique one that's correct. I'm going to force you to use that S sub delta. But in hindsight, or in maybe thinking about that, that's what I want my system to behave like. If it was a pure, to pure two pole system, what would your percent overshoot be for this combination of dominant poles? Can you reverse engineer from those S deltas what your percent overshoot should be if you just had two poles? 5% because you have an angle of 45 degrees and that zeta value of 0.7 corresponds in figure 5.7 to a 5% overshoot. And do you know how much your settling time is? 2% settling time. If those were two dominant poles, how do you determine that? So now we have a 5% overshoot, hypothetically, if it was just a two-pole system. And we don't have a two-pole system. We have a three-pole with one zero. We have a 5% overshoot, but now sigma is equal to two. And we want a 2% settling time, which is four tau, or four over sigma. So that gives us a two-second settling time. That's for a pure two-pole system. Let's now see what we can achieve with this system. We have a pole at the origin. We have a zero at minus one. 
and we have two complex poles, two complex conjugate poles at minus one plus and minus j1. Now what could we achieve with a pure gain controller in terms of closed loop behavior? If I said, well, let's just see, maybe for, if we're lucky, he's given us these closed loop poles that are already on the root locus with just using a gain as our controller, just a pure gain K. And again, when I say a controlled system, you're thinking of the block diagram. You have G preceded by K with negative unity output feedback. How do I figure out what's going to happen with a pure gain controller? And that shouldn't be a hard question. That's what we've been spending the last couple of weeks on. Draw the root locus. So if we sketch the root locus without putting any more poles and zeros, that will tell us what we can achieve with just a gain as our controller. What's the root locus of this look like? Do I have any real axis segments on the root locus? That pole is being attracted to that finite zero. What's happening off axis or off the real axis? Do we have any asymptotic behavior? What's my pole zero excess? That's a key number, isn't it? Your pole zero excess is two. That says you have a fundamental angle of 90 degrees. So whatever is happening for large K, it's going at plus and minus 90 degrees. And where are those, now we need to figure out where is the centroid or where do we locate those asymptote angles. So if we just had a pure gain Now we can say that this asymptote angle or the fundamental angle is 90 degrees and its location, I now just need to combine the poles. I have 0 minus 1 plus j, minus 1, minus j, minus, and now do you see why you don't even really need to worry about the imaginary component? You just add up the real parts of all of your poles and subtract the real parts of all of your zeros because the conjugates cancel when we're adding. Then I had a 0 at minus 1, and I divide that by my pole 0 excess, which was 2. Or now I have minus 2 plus 1, or minus 1, divided by 2. My centroid is now at minus 1 half. And I can now sketch my asymptote lines. Those are just guidelines. But I don't have to go any further, really, in all of my rules. I'm not going to unless you're asked to, I could ask you what's the departure angle? And you could calculate how does that root locus depart from those poles. Here, I don't care. I just want to know, am I going through minus 2 plus and minus J2? And what can you conclude so far? Yes, no, uh, which way am I leaning? Right or left? And we're not going to go to the poles to figure that out. I'm going to ask you, and you can figure out maybe which way we're going. We're going to approach those asymptotes as K gets bigger, and we leave those poles. And so are we getting close to where we wanted to be? which is going through those triangles. No, there's no way with a pure gain controller that we are going to have branches of our root locus going through those triangles. So we are going to have to dramatically change 
the shape of our root locus and to drastically change our root locus, that means that we are going to need a phase lead controller. So our original root locus was this root locus with pure gain. Now what we want is we want to put in a g sub c of s that's k s plus z sub c over s plus p sub c. And we already are living with that configuration. And we want to actually be at those triangles. So if we want that, how do we get it? Well, supposedly we can maybe get this with adding one zero and one pole. So now we have three parameters to adjust, a zero, a pole, and a gain. Wow, that's a lot of flexibility. So what we can do is we can maybe minimize some of that flexibility. Do I want to put my zero here? What would happen if I put my zero there? Now, now you can go to the big box store and buy a, a gross of napkins and start sketching all of these different possibilities. If we had this as our zero, and then maybe we had our pole over here, what would the root locus look like? Do you see that we would have something there and something there, right? And what would happen? These two would do that. Is that what we want? No. But you can quickly sketch that and figure out what's maybe possible, what isn't. For a big enough gain, this is going to go unstable, isn't it? So that's not what we want. We don't want that zero over there. Boy, this is going to get messy. Now I have to try to put a real axis through the same line. Okay, just humor me. Let's assume that's in the same location. So a zero in the right half plane didn't work, but we can put in unstable poles and unstable zeros. It might be to our advantage at some point. So don't just go home today and say, well, we can't ever put zeros or poles in the right half plane. We can. What can we never do, though, unless you want to fail the class? We can't cancel poles and zeros in the right half plane or on the imaginary axis. So we don't want to cancel, but we can put things over there, and it might be to our advantage. We might have an unstable system that we put an unstable controller with it, and boom, we've now stabilized the whole thing. So there's ways of two unstables making a stable. Possibly, yes. Can we have a pole at the origin? Yeah, we can put poles anywhere we want, can't we? Oh, yes, we had a pole at the origin. Oh, wow. Okay, well, you just saw another diagram. But now if we did the same thing, if we put a zero here, we would never be stable, would we? If we actually had the real starting system. So this one, I hope, tells you. And then, 
Uh, can I do this gently? Okay. So here's what we have. And now we want to try to bring the root locus through the triangle. Well, one strategy, and what happens if we start putting those zeros closer and closer to the imaginary axis? This happens, doesn't it? So we have more overshoot. So there's this trade-off that we have to think about. One way to try to account for that trade-off is to say, you know what, I have so many options, let me just go ahead and start by saying let's let the zero be right underneath where I want my dominant poles and see if I can place a pole to get my root locus to go through the triangles. So this is just one strategy. And it's sort of a trade-off already. We're not going too far to the right. The further we go to the right, the more we're going to probably bend things around the way we want but we don't want to go too far to the right. You've probably heard a lot of right and left the last few days, so we're kind of trying to be in the middle here, okay? Trying to compromise, trade off. One strategy, we want to locate the controller zero under the upper dominant pole. So if you don't even know where to start on your first napkin, you can try this strategy. You can say, well, let me just put it underneath the dominant pole. So now I have a, a zero right there. And I have a pole that I have to put down. And now how am I going to figure out where to put this pole? Do I just start iterating and guessing and checking? No, we have a better way than doing that. We can actually find this location, this minus P sub C, by using our phase angle condition. We know that at, if, we want the body, if we want the root locus to go through the triangle, then we have to have a phase of minus 180 at that triangle location, if that's going to be on our root locus. If we wanted our root locus to go through that triangle, then all the angles algebraically need to sum such that we get an angle of minus 180 based on where that pole is at minus P sub C. That's our adjustable parameter. We can change the angle contributed by that pole by sliding that pole to various locations P sub C. And we'll slide it in such a way that we get its angle to be such that all of the angles algebraically sum to minus 180. So we're going to find P sub C and we're going to use the phase angle condition to use it, to do that. There's our characteristic equation. That says that we have g sub c of s, g of s, equaling minus 1. But since we are electrical engineers, we know how to interpret minus 1. Oh, that's a complex number. If you really want to get somebody nervous, you, you say, what else is minus 1? And you say, well, it's a complex number. <laughs> Then you might get people a little bit nervous, but everybody in this room is very comfortable with seeing that minus 1 rewritten as 1 at minus 180. That means then that this angle of g sub c of s g of s needs to be minus 180 degrees. So let me see if I can draw what I'm trying to describe. And don't let me forget poles and zeros. We had a pole there. 
we had a pole here, I'm sorry, a zero there, we had a pole there and we want to be clear up here and we had another pole there. And now I want to try to draw some, oh, and we also said let's place our controller zero right there. This was minus one, there's zero, etc. Here's J, here's J2. So we have this angle, and I'll call that theta sub p sub 1. We have this angle, which is actually the same angle, but we'll call that theta p sub 0. We also have this angle, and I'll call that theta sub z sub 1. We have this angle. which I will call theta z p sub 2. And we have this angle, theta z sub c, and we also have an angle due to this pole that we haven't yet located. It's at some point minus p sub c, and we're trying to figure out what is that angle, theta p sub c, so that all of these angles sum to minus 180. Do you want a little bit of a tip that you don't want to be doing on the exam in a week? You're going to now say, oh, I want poles at these two locations. I want my root locus to go through, whoops, minus 2 plus and minus j2. Somebody, I know, hopefully no one in this room, so now you have an advantage over more than half the class. <laughs> Just saying. Here, don't include this angle. That angle is a known, that one doesn't contribute an angle in this phase angle condition. Because this is just a point on the root locus. It's not a polar zero in G sub C and G. Is that clear? So this is a closed loop pole. And it does not enter into the phase angle condition. Is that clear? So if you've now drawn these two triangles and you go, oh, I want my root locus to go through there, and then you get all excited because you're calculating all of these angles and somebody's going to throw that angle in there and they're going to say, oh, there's another angle that I have to worry about. No, that angle is not contributing to the phase angle. Only poles and zeros in G sub C and G need to be worried about in this phase angle condition. That's what we just said right here. The angle of G sub C, G is minus 180. So that now we can start doing the analysis. We know that we have K, S plus Z sub C over S plus P sub C times our original plant, which was 4, S plus 1 over S, S plus 1 squared plus 1 squared. We want to find the angle of that, and that better equal minus 180 degrees. That's what we're playing with. Or we can now say, well, we can do this in two stages. We now can sum the angles of our, due to our zeros, since they're in the numerator, and subtract the sum of our angles due to the poles. And those we will set equal to minus 180 degrees. In terms of how we've defined these angles, we have a theta z sub 1, that was due to the 0 at minus 1, and we had a theta z sub c, that was due to our controller. 
Then we had subtracted an angle due to the pole at the origin, our pole at minus 1 plus j1, an angle due to the pole at minus 1 minus j1, and an angle due to our controller pole. Is it clear where those angles are coming from? They're in our diagram. Hopefully this expression is consistent with the diagram. And now you can go back and use your trig to find these angles. What's the angle of, let's do an easy one first. What's the angle from the controller zero up to the triangle? We located that zero right underneath that location so that gives us an easy angle that's 90 degrees what about theta sub z sub 1 well you can eyeball that and you have a good idea it's between 90 and what 180 for real extremes but you can kind of anticipate what that angle will be and if you calculate it the way I like to do is I say, okay, that's 180 degrees minus the acute angle. And I need to go up 2 and over 1. And that's about a 63 degree angle. So the sum of those ends up being 117 degrees. And that seems to be consistent with that picture that I drew. What about theta p sub 0. What's the angle from the origin to minus 2 plus j2? That's an easy angle, isn't it? That's 135 degrees. What about from the upper complex pole? Well, that had exactly the same angle. That's 135 degrees as well. Theta p sub 2. Well, that's 180 degrees minus the inverse tangent. What's the vertical distance between that lower complex pole and the minus 2 plus J2? We have to walk up three steps and over one. That's about 72 degrees, and this gives us now 108 degrees. Now we have all of the numbers. We can put them in. We have 90 degrees plus 117 degrees. Those are the two zeros that we have. We had a couple of poles contributing 135 degrees. We had that bottom pole. And then we had the unknown pole due to our controllers pole. And all of those need to sum to minus 180. If we do the algebra, we end up with a pole of 9 degrees. That means pictorially, if you wanted to think about it, here's this location. It's J2, so this distance here is 2. And we need to find this distance, let's say x, to give this angle of 9 degrees. And now do you realize why you shouldn't have been sleeping through your trig class? Now we just have another trig problem, right? We need to find x. Here's minus p sub c. We know that this little piece is already 2. So we can't make p sub c just at, I mean x. p sub c is going to be 2 plus x. Is that clear? But if we find x, now we can say the tangent of theta p sub c is 2 over x. And we can solve for x. x is now 2 over the tangent. And we know what theta p sub c is. We just calculated that. That was 9 degrees. This ends up being 12.6. So that now p sub c is 2 plus x, or this is now 14.6.
what do we have? We now have g sub c of s, our controller is k, s plus 2 over s plus 14.6. Is it clear where we came up with that? Now how do we find k? How do we find k? Well, we just sit there and turn the knob. Yes, we do. We just sit there and turn the knob, but how can we find the exact location of that knob setting? From the magnitude condition. So now we put the magnitude of g sub c g equal to 1, solve for k, where? At s equal to minus 2 plus j2, and boom, we have our k. We will find, or you will find, after class, that this k, boy, we have a lot of happy nines today. We had an angle of nine, we had a gain of nine. The pole should have been at nine, too, and then we would have had a triple. Everybody would have been nice, but we don't. We have two 14.6 and a k of nine, and we'll figure that out after class. We'll pick up here with more controller design on Friday.